to see you this morning. I uh, appreciate you being here. I'm thankful uh, to see your face again. Uh, thanks, Lance, for letting us stand for that song. I know it's figurative, but I always think it's nice when we get to stand, uh, when we sing Dare to Stand Like Joshua. I guess it puts it a little bit, a little bit more in perspective than it already does. If you'd like to take out your Bibles and turn to Colossians 3, we'll be looking at this verse here. I was reading it this week, and and verse 9 stood out to me a little bit. Chapter 3 in Colossians, Paul's saying, you know, these are the things you need to put off, get rid of. These are the things that you need to put on. And the list of things he's saying you need to put off, in verse 8, chapter 3, he says this, but now yourselves are put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, Filthy language out of your mouth. And he says this. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds. You know, here's just another general list that Paul's lives. You know, this is a list of sins you shouldn't do. And I stopped at verse 9 thinking like, why didn't he just say, do not lie, since you put off the old man with his deeds? That would work. You know, just don't lie, right? And that would be a, a good general a principle of righteousness. That's fine. That's true. But he does say here, in my version at least, do not lie to one another. And I wonder that perhaps Paul was addressing here, obviously, a local congregation, a church at Colossae, and expressly saying, when you're thinking about lying, make sure you don't lie to your brethren. Or do not lie to one another. Do not lie to each other because you've put off the old man. You're not supposed to live that life anymore. The more I started thinking about it, I was like, you know, the people that you lie to, if you are a liar on a regular basis, you know, you have basically three subjects. you got your family. You might lie to them. If you're a liar, you might lie to your employer. You might lie to the people at work. And third, I thought, you know what? If you're a liar, you also probably lie to your brethren. Right? You're in a contact with them a lot. Uh, they're supposed to hold you accountable for the things you're doing in this life. Well, if you're a liar, you probably lie to them too. And so I wanted to kind of explore that topic this morning about lying specifically to our brethren. What I did is obviously seeing the commandment here, do not lie to one another. We know this is wrong. This is something we need to correct. But I picked out four lies, three of them very general and the last one very specific, of lies that we say to our brethren, right? Lies we say directly. And let's kind of explore that. The first one is going to be the one we're going to spend the most time on. And we'll move quickly through the other three. But the first one is the lies we say to hide our sin to our brethren. Those lies. You have the situation where we're trying to live a double life. We're trying to serve two masters. Someone comes up and says, Andrew, were you there at this place? I thought I saw you. No, I wasn't there. Well, that was a lie, right? Andrew, are you doing this? No, I'm not doing that. Well, that's a lie, right? And practicing what we preach in that situation when our brethren are trying to hold us accountable. Where are some thoughts we need to think about this if we're those that lie to hide our sin? Ultimately, good and evil are exposed, right? So actually, if you think about the solution to lying about your sin, does it solve any problems? Well, no, it's going to easily be uncovered, right? Let's look at 1 Timothy. Several passages we could go to to talk about this. We go to Ecclesiastes when it talks about God revealing everything that's good or evil. We could have gone to 2 Corinthians about God revealing everything that's going to be good and evil on the last day. But Paul says this at the end of 1 Timothy chapter 5. Looking at verse 24, he says, Some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment. But those of some men follow later. And he says the same thing works with good works in verse 25. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, but those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. If we have the NIV here, I wanted to read this because I think it's sometimes a little tricky, this passage. Verse 24 in the NIV, it says, The sins of some are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them. In the same way, good deeds are obvious, and even those who are not obvious cannot remain hidden forever. Paul making the point that there's going to be sometimes there's sin in your life that's bluntly obvious, right? They know about it, we know about it, you post about it on Instagram, the whole world knows about the sin you're involved in. But some sins you try to hide with lies. And he says ultimately those sins too 
are going to be exposed. And they're going to be clearly evident as well. And maybe that's the working of God here on this earth, or ultimately we can say it's even the working of God at the last day. And so when you think about sin and think about lying about sin in this situation, sin is obviously going to happen. And sin's a problem in all of our lives. Thankfully, Jesus is going to be the solution to that problem. Repentance will be the solution to that problem. However, it still is a problem and it's still there. Well, for some reason our worldly minds think, you know, I'm going to cover up the sin with a lie. Does that work according to this passage? It doesn't work, right? And what we'll see throughout all these lies we're going to talk about, lying for some reason we think it's a solution. We think lies, you know, this is the solution to the problem. You think about the very first lie that we read about in the Bible, and Satan says, you will surely not die. You can eat the fruit. Here, Eve, I presented a solution. You can eat the fruit and not receive the consequences for it. And yet it wasn't a solution, was it? Actually, what lies do, they're not solutions. They inflate the problem. That's all it does. It inflates the problem that already exists instead of getting rid of the problem. And we'll see that in all of these. Lies put a sinister spin on something that's already evil. Right? I've been asking some of y'all throughout the week about this. Some of y'all I've talked to about this. But I asked everybody, what's the lie that you think about that covered up sin in the Bible? Think about someone in the Old Testament. Who's someone that lied in an attempt to cover up their sin? And the fan pick, the fan pick favorite here was Aaron. And we're going to read Aaron. There's so many options for this. We could have gone Cain killing Abel all the way back there. We could have gone to several situations. It looks like Ananias and Sapphira maybe. Lots of liars, but here especially this one to try to cover up sin in Exodus 32. In Exodus 32, to jump here in the middle of the story, Moses is on top of Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments written with God's own finger. And all of a sudden God says, they're doing something down there, they're already in sin. And what we find out in verse 4, that the people wanted to build a golden calf, a golden image. In verse 32, if you look at verse 4 real quickly... It says that Aaron called those to bring their gold to him. And it says, and he received the gold from their hand. He fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. And they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So Aaron gets the gold. He molds the gold. He gets an engraving tool. And he makes this golden calf and says, this calf brought you out of Egypt. God finds out about this. He says, Moses, I'm going to kill him right now. I'm going to start a brand new nation with you. And Moses talks them, you know, basically out of it. And he says a pre-shadow of the mediator that Jesus does. And what Moses does is says, well, God, you don't want to take them out of here of Egypt and just kill them. What are the other nations going to say about you? And then he says, and Lord, remember your promises made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. How you said you were going to make them a great nation. So God makes the decision there, no, I'm not going to destroy them, but you need to go stop it. So Moses goes down there. He meets Joshua halfway down the mountain. And as they're going there, Joshua says, I think something's going on in the crowd. I think there's a fight. And Moses says, "Uh uh-uh, I hear singing. They get there, and Moses sees the golden calf. What Moses does with the golden calf, and I think this is the part that we actually really love, he grinds it up, and he makes the people drink it. You know, he just completely destroys it. And this is what Aaron says about the situation in verse 21. It says, Moses said to Aaron, why did these people do to you? that you have brought this great sin against them. And Aaron said, Do not let the anger of the Lord become hot. You know the people, that they are set on evil. And they said to me, Make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And I said to them, Whoever has any gold, let them break it off. And so they gave it to me. I cast it into the fire. And this calf came out. What in the world, Aaron? Was that what we saw in verse 4? In verse 4 it says that he collected the gold, he formed the golden calf, he got an engraving tool, and he made the golden calf. And we get here the next verse in the 20s and it says, Aaron goes, oh, I put the gold in the fire and the calf just came out. And by the way, the whole reason why this is happening is because these people are evil and they told me to do this. What is Aaron doing here? Well, he is lying to try to cover up his sin, the problems that he's inflicted on the people. And what has it done? It's just inflated the situation. What I want to leave this thought with, and I'm going to bring this up again, is that lies put a sinister spin on our mistakes. You know, if I go and I make a mistake, I've done something wrong. You know, maybe you've caught me in the act, 
And then you come up and you try to talk to me about it, and I say, well, we know that didn't happen. Well, that's not the reason why that happened. I did something else. Well, you just saw it wrong. Yet you know you saw it happen. What does that say about me? That says that I just didn't just make a mistake, but now my heart is evil. My heart is corrupt. It's this sinister spin on the mistake that's already done, and now there's even more worry, and there's even more concern. Proverbs says this, Proverbs 28, 13, He who covers his sins will not prosper. It doesn't work. But he who ever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Right? We have a mistake. We understand we've all been there. We've all sinned. What's the solution? You can repent and you can seek mercy. And then it's on us to give you mercy. Right? You put the responsibility on us to forgive you in that situation. But if you try to cover it, what's going to happen? You're just going to inflate the problem. And you will not prosper. You will not be able to move on. Lies are not a solution for sin. Because lies do not, cannot, cover sin. So when we make mistakes, when we sin, let's not lie about them if it gets brought up. Let's not lie about them. Because it does not fix the problem. Now the oppositely, lies cannot cover sin, but what can cover sin? Peter, 1 Peter 4, says this. He says, love will cover a multitude of sins. Not just one sin, a multitude of sins. There's a lot of different ways we go with this. We say Jesus' love covers the multitude of sins that we have. That works. I think it also works well in this context. When we let love take over when we've made mistakes, when we've sinned, love has the ability to seek out mercy in those situations. Love doesn't inflate problems. It solves problems, right? Let's have a loving attitude when we're in this situation, not a lying attitude. So let's move to our second one here. We don't want to hide sin with our lies, but also sometimes we don't want to lie to avoid action. And I think this is a lie that's said to brethren often. We're asked to do something. Sometimes people ask help from us, right? That happens a lot. Sometimes a lot of help is asked from us. Several of us here have a certain set of particular skills. And that skill set, so nice that you have, you get asked help for a lot. I've asked David Knoll about four things about this new house. David, what do I do about this? David, what do I do about that? When I repaired my fridge, Mr. Ken's come and he's helped help me repair my fridge once. When I was able to do it the second time I came, Mr. Ken, I repaired my fridge. You'd be so proud of me. I didn't even have to ask your help this time. We do this a lot, don't we? And we usually know what people are good at. And we go to those people and we say, hey, can you help me do this? And usually that person's able to help us in that situation. I remember being a teenage boy with a pickup truck. An old red beat up pickup truck that I had backed into several things with. And when you're a young teenage boy at a congregation with a pickup truck, what's the one skill set that everyone wants you to use? Andrew, I need your help moving something. Right? Andrew, I need your help moving something. Andrew, you're a young buck. You can come. You can move this easy. Right? Andrew, you're not going to hurt tomorrow morning. Just come over here and spend all Saturday helping me move something. Right? When you're young and you're a boy, that's what happens to us a lot. And I remember, you know, a lot of my Saturdays were taking because I was moving stuff. I was moving this. I was moving that. And then the whole time, usually while you're moving, the older guys are sitting there going, you're doing a great job. Right? Great supervisors. Wonderful supervisors. (laughs) I remember doing this when I was like 18, 19, and I remember just thinking, when I get to be an adult, which I guess maybe still hasn't happened yet, when I get to be an adult, I'm never, ever going to do this. I'm never, ever going to work those teenage boys. Because this is what we do. You know, we got to move something. We go, oh, I'll just get some boys from church to do it. I'll just get the boys from church to do it. I had to move the couch the other day, and I couldn't believe it. I called Ross, and I said, Ross, can you help me move this couch? I did it, right? I did it. Thankfully, I was able to do it myself. I didn't need Ross's help. But that's the reality of the relationships that we build because of the brotherhood. Right? We're around each other. We want to help each other. And that's great. That's that's awesome we do that. However, sometimes when we're asked and we're asked and we're asked, we need to sometimes need a break. And that's okay. And I think there's a solution to that. However, the solution is not to lie about it. To lie and make an excuse so we can get out of the action that's been asked of us. Because it'd be easier just to say, I'm sorry, I'm sick, I can't come. I'm sorry, i got to be somewhere, I can't come. That's not true. You just need a break. Or you need to do something else. 
And yet, for some reason, again, we believe lying is the solution, which, of course, it is not. Proverbs says this. Proverbs 22. I love this proverb. He says that the lazy man says, there's a lion outside. I shall be slain in the streets. And you can read lots of different commentaries on this verse. They all kind of go different directions, but it all kind of makes the general point. That lazy men, lazy women, will make up any excuse they possibly can to get out of work. Any excuse, anything. Oh, uh, there's a line outside. I I can't leave the house. He's going to kill me if I get out. Right? That's something a lazy liar would try to get out of the problem. And that's the problem because that, as a lie, is what? That is sin, isn't it? To say that there's a lion outside, even though how ridiculous it may be. Here's the right way to handle this situation. And let's turn to 2 Corinthians 1. You can see Paul's attitude here. Paul obviously had a lot of certain skills, too, that people needed. And Paul would often get brethren ask them, Paul, we need you to come here. We need you to work with us. You need to help us. And Paul was getting pulled all the time, people asking for him to help. But Paul had a solution when he couldn't come when he needed a break or when he needed to be somewhere else. He didn't lie about it. He was just upfront and honest with them about what the situation was. And I'm throwing us here again into the middle of a story. But Paul is in Macedonia. And there are things going down in Macedonia that require his attention. He had told the Corinthians previously that he was going to come, but he wasn't able to because of the things going on in Macedonia. And so instead, he sent Titus to check on him. And here he's defending himself in this passage, saying, I couldn't come to you, but that's okay. All right? I told you I couldn't come. Didn't expect that I wasn't keeping my promises. It was never a promise in the first place. I'm just trying the best I can. Look here in verse 15 of chapter 1. He says, And in this confidence I intended to come to you before, that you might have a second benefit, to pass way of you to Macedonia, to come again from Macedonia to you, and to be helped by you on the way to Judea. Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? Or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh? That with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no. But as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among to you by me, Sylvanus, Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen. The glory of God through us. It makes a distinction. There's a difference between me and God. When God says he's going to do something, it is always yes. Because God always keeps his promises and there aren't hindrances to God. Nothing can stop God from keeping his promises. But he says with me, I'm a human. That doesn't work. He says our answer to you was not yes, we're going to come. No, we're not. He said we're going to try the best we can. We don't know what's going to happen. And guess what? In this situation, it didn't happen. Right? Right? And so when we're asked to do these things to help in this way, let's just be straight up and honest with people instead of thinking we have to make an excuse like there's a line outside, I can't get out, I can't come help you. I'm sick, I I have to be out of town, I have to take someone to their car. There's no reason to lie, right? That is a worldly solution to a problem that can be handled in a great way. Let's just be honest with people. Someone is asking a lot of you, it's okay to say, hey, I... I just need a break. I need a break today, but hey, can I help you and give them another day, right? Now, there's going to be some times when we can make the sacrifices. And I would point you to the sermon we did previously last week, because when we make those sacrifices and help someone in some way, what is that? Well, that's grace, right? And that's wonderful we can do that, but honesty is better. I said I was worried about this, number one, because it's sin when we lie, even though it might be something we consider small. But I even worry more of it because of this. If we're going to lie about the simple things like this, is it going to become easier to lie about the serious things? It is, right? Sometimes we talk about certain drugs as a gateway drug. That this drug is not what you're going to endlessly get hooked on. What it is, you're going to start on this drug, and this drug is going to lead you to stronger drugs. They're going to be more harmful to you and to your family. I think in a lot of ways, this is a gateway lie. Little lies like this to avoid action, this is a gateway to start lying about more and more serious things. Even to the point of going back to our first problem, lying about our sin, right? And it puts that sinister spin on us and and on our heart that we absolutely don't need. This is going to be one of the 
big problems that begin our journey into a world of liars, people we don't want to be. Here's my third general lie that we say to each other. Lies about identity, about who we are. Lots of different ways I could go with this. I could talk about living a double life and how you, I try to pretend and try to make you believe I'm one person when I'm really living a completely different life. I think that's a good thing, but I think we already covered that in talking about our first one, lies about our sin, right? Lying about our sinful life. So I want to go a different direction. But think about this. Let's look, turn to Mark 14, and we have Peter's lies when he's denying that he's not Peter, he's not one of the disciples of Jesus. And even the lie that he doesn't even know who Jesus is. I've picked Mark because Mark throws this all in one section where we can read it relatively quickly. And as we know, Jesus told Peter that Satan's going to tempt you. He's going to try to get you to deny me three times. And when it happens, the rooster is going to crow this third time. And you're going to realize what's going on. And this is what's happening. Jesus has been taken into the trial. Peter's following close behind. And people start asking him, hey, do you know Jesus? You're one of the people that knows Jesus. Mark 14, verse 66. Now as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You, are, you also were with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are saying. And when he went out of the porch and the rooster crowed, and a rooster crowed, And the servant girl saw him again and began to say to those who stood by, This is one of them. But he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by and said to Peter again, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. Your speech shows it. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know the man of whom you speak. And a second time the rooster crowed. And Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he thought about it, he wept. Looking at this passage, what do you think it was Peter's motivation to lie here? We talked about our motivation previously was we needed a break. What would have been the motivation here to lie about who he was, his identity? I think that motivation was fear. And to be fair to Peter, it was a fearful situation. You know, this person he's been following for three years, this person with wonderful, incredible power, has all of a sudden told him to put his sword away and to let him be taken by this angry mob, right? And and he knows Jesus can escape, but Jesus isn't escaping. And so he's worried, he's concerned, and now all of a sudden they're after him. Well, you were with him, right? You're one of his disciples. No, I I don't know who you're talking about, right? Basically saying, I don't even know what you're talking about. He says, again, the servant goes, so you're one of him. He says, no, 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 you're not talking, You're, you're not making sense. And then finally some people around him, they're like, I can hear by your accent, you're Galilean, you're one of them. He says no, and then he curses and he swears, he says, I don't even know who the man is, right? Talking about Jesus. What is all this motivated by? This is motivated by his fear. He's terrified. And he's looking to lies as what? As a solution. And of course, it is not the solution. It isn't anywhere, it isn't there. We see here as well, do we lie to each other because of our fear? Do we lie to each other because of our fear? When I look around this room, I don't see people that I should be afraid of. I see gentle people. I see kind people. I see people that are long-suffering. However, I understand that sometimes being part of a congregation, we can become fearful of what other people think about us or having a confrontation in front of somebody else. This is going to be my first Church of Christ stereotype that I want to talk about this morning. I use air quotes here when I say Church of Christ. Church of Christ stereotype. What the stereotype is, is that we are harsh on each other. And we are hard on each other. And maybe I'm in a situation when I need to tell someone or rebuke someone because of what they're doing. And because of my own fear, I'm scared to let them know that the person who said it was me. That I want to correct someone, I want to be critical of someone, but I don't want to have to reveal my identity that it's me. Now, that idea to hide our identity, to conceal our identity so that we can teach something or preach something, that's not a new topic. You were here in the Romans class, we talked about that that happened in Romans. Someone tried to conceal their identity, make them believe it was Paul, and taught a new gospel. Something that was wrong. We see the same thing in the Second Thessalonians. Someone writes a fake letter and says it's from Paul. It says, oh, Jesus already came back. 
Well, why did they do that? I think they were motivated by their fear. And they wanted to put that message as if it was from Paul so they didn't have to put their own name out there. And so I think sometimes we want to do that sort of thing. We want to get something moving. We want to do something. But we don't want to put our own name out there. And so the solution sometimes ends up being anonymous messages. And that's something that happens at lots of different churches. And just talking to people, my friends from different places, I've heard of almost every church I've been to had to deal with some type of anonymous criticism with no identity given. Well, go ahead and just call off from Peter. What's the motivation behind anonymous criticism? It's fear, right? And that doesn't work because God didn't give us a spirit of fear. He gave us a spirit of love and of control, right, and of peace. That doesn't fit this. We don't stand like Joshua in that situation, do we? We're trying to have a solution in line which isn't there. Now, go ahead and go with me to left field for just a second. We're going to left field. Answer me this. Have you ever considered the power of anonymous giving? Anonymous giving. This is a good thing. All right? This is a good thing. Sometimes we need to help someone out, and we, we don't want our identity to know. We learn from Jesus that he says, I don't even want your right hand to know your left hand what you're doing. You're thinking, I want to do some good. I don't want any credit. I just want this to be between me and God. I'm just going to go ahead and give that person something, leave it on their doorstep, ring the doorbell, run away, ding-dong ditch, but it's okay because there's a gift there, right? They open the door. They get this gift. They get the thing that they need, and that makes them happy. And, of course, it supplies their need, right? And you've made some kind of sacrifice. You've been able to bestow this type of grace. Well, of course, they assume it was one of their brethren that helped them in this way, right? This is the power of anonymous giving. They go into the Lord's church. They gather together with the Lord's church on Sunday. They see everybody, and what do they think? Well, who gave it to you? Well, who helped me? Oh, I, I bet it was Mr. Ricky. No, 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 I bet it was Mr. Kim. <laughs> No, no, I I bet it was Mr. Dale. You know, I I bet it was... That's what happens, right? We start assuming that it's just everybody. Everybody has helped us in this way. And we're able to stir up good works and be encouraging. And we have this warm heart that's developed because of anonymous giving, right? It's very, very powerful. And I think it can be a good, very good thing. But in that power, have you ever considered the power of anonymous criticism? Even if it's right. You know, even if the criticism is correct. And then you receive something like that and you come, you gather with the Lord's church, and you know it's from one of your brethren. What do you think? Well, this could have been brother so-and-so. Or this could have been this brother. Or this could have been this brother. And it creates a divide between that person and the entire flock. Because they don't know who is critical of them. This is when the lie happens. Because usually in those situations, it starts getting asked, well, did you do this? Well, did you write this? Well, did you write this? And when does the lie come in? Just like Peter, no, I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't even know what you're talking about. Right? In that situation, I hope that person does have love. The love that covers multitudes and sending out, you know what, that was me. I should not have handled it that way. But hey, let's get together and let's talk more about this. You know, I'm sorry for that. Right? That would be a great way that love would cover that situation. Because love can cover a multitude of sins. So something to think about this. Let's not lie about our identity. We're all brothers and sisters. We're part of a brotherhood. Let's work with each other, right? Sometimes we need to be a little bit critical of somebody. Let's have a face-to-face conversation. That's when that love can be communicated, right? That's when that love can be communicated. Here's my last lie. And I think this one is the most somber out of them all, and it's a very specific lie. This lie right here. Do you ever say this to your brothers and sisters? I'm okay. I'm okay. To be fair, sometimes we say I'm okay or I'm fine, and what we're trying to communicate is I'm content. And that's a good thing. And that's a fine thing, right? I can say as well, that's an okay thing, right? It's okay, it's fine to say, you know, I am content. And that's what we mean by that. And that means not everything's great, but I find peace. And I'm okay in that way. And that's not the lie that I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the lie when we are not okay and everything is wrong. And yet, for some reason, as a, again, a church Christ stereotype, I hate saying it, but I feel like it gets communicated a lot, that <coughs> hateful stereotype that and as a member of the church, you're supposed to just sit there and pretend like everything's fine all the time, when that's not the truth, when there is something wrong that needs to be addressed, and you're not okay. Going back to the Apostle Paul back in 2 Corinthians 1, Paul told his brethren often when he was not okay. 
And we think about the way we picture Paul as being so strong and so bold in his emotions and so powerful and being able to stand up to any challenge. And yet even Paul would tell his brethren brethren, when he was not okay. Back in chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians, he says in verse 8, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we were despaired even of life. Yes, we have the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from such a great of death, and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. You, also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by the many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. One of the problems that comes along when we think this is the solution, let me just hide my problems, but when we actually decide to tell people, what that does is that allows for what to happen. Here in verse 11 it tells us, it allows prayer to happen. When people know what's going on in your life. Know that everything's not okay for Andrew. Andrew needs help in this world. Well, what we can do, we can pray for him. Well, when I lie and say, oh, I'm okay, everything's fine, I try to cover up all those problems, it causes this problem. It inflates the problem. When I lie about my problems, it prevents powerful prayer from the brethren, right? What does James say about powerful prayer from the brethren? The righteous man, his prayer, it avails much, right? It can do a lot. Imagine what he says here, the many, the many praying for you, what it can do if you let your brethren know that everything's not okay. However, when we say that lie, it prevents prayer from happening in this way, which could be such a great solution, and yet for some reason sometimes we choose lying as the solution instead. I think one thing that we are good at in this regard is we are very good at telling each other when things aren't okay with our physical problems, our physical ailments. I think we're good at that. I think sometimes when we're sick, you know, we'll tell people, hey, I'm sick, right? And a lot of that has to do because you can't come to worship service, right? And I think that's kind of the logical thing. I can't come to worship service, I have the flu, but let it be announced. Right? Andrew has the flu, he's not here, he's sick, right? And someone might say a prayer for Andrew to get over the flu. That's great. That's a great thing to do. I'm glad that we're good at communicating about our physical problems. I'm happy that that's the situation. When we're sick or maybe we've lost a loved one in that way. But I think there's something that we're not good at. I don't think we're good about telling each other about our mental or our emotional or here maybe most importantly, our spiritual problems. We're not as good as talking about those things as we are talking about our physical problems. Now Paul here in this passage, you know, we know Paul had physical problems. He was a human. He dealt with those things. I'm sure he told people about it. But if we read verse 8 again, he says, we were burdened beyond measure above strength so that we were despaired even of life. Was that a physical ailment? I think he's talking about an emotional problem there. And I think he's been in so much stress that he's despaired even of life. Maybe it's the spiritual aspect of it that his faith is hurting because of the persecution that's going on in Macedonia. And so he needs to tell his brethren, brethren, I need you to pray for me because I'm not okay in the spiritual aspect of my life. Brethren, I need to pray for me because I'm not good in the emotional aspect of my life. Can you please pray for me? Right? And that gives us that access to that powerful prayer. I think this was a more sombering one, definitely not as sinister as the other three. Not that sinister spin to it, but something I think we need to be aware of. If Paul was willing to tell people that he wasn't okay, I should be willing to tell people I'm not okay. Thank you for your close attention. And there was the four that we did. We talked about lying to cover up our sins. We talked about lying to avoid action. We talked about lying about our identity and the lie I'm, not okay, I'm okay when obviously that we're not. As I said here at the end, that I believe that prayer is powerful. And Paul believed prayer was powerful. You think about an apostle that actually can talk to God. He communes with God in that way. And what does he want? He wants these brethren to pray to God too for him. Because Paul believed that prayer was powerful too. So I'm going to as well. There's someone here that needs the prayers of the congregation. That's something that we want to do for you, right? And that's why we have like this whole coming forward thing. Like obviously we want to baptize people, but as well as offer to brethren... Do you need prayers, right? And so what I ask you to do is that if you do need the prayers of the congregation as a whole, 
which is something that we absolutely want to meet for you, and you are not okay in some way. It could be a physical ailment. It could, and we would be willing to pray for that. It could be a spiritual ailment, and we so much want to pray for something like that. It could be any of those ailments. If there's some way that we can pray for you, of course, if you would like to be baptized into Jesus Christ. Why don't you come forward as we stand and as we sing?